Expo here in Manchester Event City. As you can see, it's still pretty empty. The general public haven't been allowed entry yet, but it's absolutely huge event. Thank you very much, Dean. Thank and the you. cameraman for today is the wonderful Dean Swain. That is I. There we go. And show off your t-shirt, buddy. Looking for solid. Right, so let's have a little wander around and let's see what we've got here. Uh, like absolutely massive down here. <laughs> We've got, I think it's some cosplay things down there. And here we go, we've got some machines coming up. Now the first set of machines we have, go on Dean, you can Atari, model this. Atari 2600, a oh, Woody. Yeah, look with, at that. With Hero. With Hero in there. Bill Atone, which was, this is this, what I had first of all. That is what I had as well. Yeah. That was my uh, machine that I had, I remember that. And of course, wow. a lovely Vectrex. So Dean, 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 all right, so next up here is the Nintendo DS. And it's got Pandora's box. And this one here has got some retro classics. Ah, oh, fantastic. This is more like it. It is a Game Gear. Now, sadly, a lot of these things haven't been turned on yet. There's one more that has. There we go. That's Sonic the Hedgehog. Now, one thing I'll always remember about Sonic the Hedgehog on the Game Gear, basically, it ran a lot faster than it did on the Sega Master System. I did not know that. All right, here we go. The Game Gear, now Dean, is this the classic, oh, we can see you in the reflection there. Hey, here I am. <laughs> Dean, um, Dean's even got his own game. Right, this is a Mark 1 Lynx. It's huge. It's, uh, you know, it's bigger than a brick. But, um, yeah, you're not switched on. SNK. What were these called? Um, I'm not too sure. Well, it's a little SNK handheld. Yeah. It's not a bad little machine. I've never seen one look like that. Quite nice. Oh, it's a nice little conversion of uh, Pac-Man there. Pretty decent. PSP. Yeah. Not really interested in those. A Game Boy Color. Now, I've got one of these. I've got the um, Pokemon one. So, and Dean, why don't you show us what else we've got here, mate? We have got a yellowed Game Boy. <laughs> <laughs> the classic brick-like Game Boy. Right, so this is with Tetris, which was one of the games it came bundled in with, and basically it really re revolutionised the um, handheld market. Before that, all we had was the Game & Watches, which, talking of which, my favourite little Game & Watch ever, Snoopy Tennis. Yeah. Absolutely love that, absolutely it's fantastic. Full screen Donkey Kong 2. This. Right, so here we are again, we're back. We've got another uh, Atari machine down there. Dean, why don't you come over here and show us what we got here. We got a Sega Mega Drive. The super off-road yep. uh, Great game. I've never played the Mega Drive version. I had this on the Spectrum and on the Amiga. But a great little game. So yeah, we've got a number of different systems here. Here we've got one of Glenn's favourite systems ever, the Commodore 64. And what I loved about it was the trademark sort of like uh, screen there. It was absolutely amazing. It's just that cold colour blue setup. And Dean? Look what's here right next to you, buddy. Ah, dum, dum, dum. Road Rash. We've had the joy, joy pad plugged in. Great game, though. Do love this. Now, what really stood out for me was these uh, cartridges. The cartridges had these little yellow things here on the side, which were really synonymous with the uh, EA games. Now, at the time, I thought there was some sort of special trickery that they had, but it was EA who actually produced these cartridges to give them a distinctive look. Yeah. And they really did stand up for that reason. Now, this is the uh, Mega Drive 2, isn't it? It is. Not as nice as the original Mega Drive, I would say. But it's still one that I'd like to add to my collection. Definitely. Right then, Dean, what have we got next? Up next, a Nintendo Entertainment System. Not too sure what game this is. This is um, 
Days of Thunder, that looks That's like. That's it, Days of Thunder, yeah. Which was based on the really awful Tom Cruise movie of the same name. And I believe the game was pretty awful itself. Right. And moving on from the 8 bit Nintendo. The Nintendo, Super Nintendo, SNES, F Zero. It's one of the best games ever yes. that really showcased the the graphics of the new 16-bit machine. All right, so Dean's gonna show off a little bit, make sure that my camera doesn't get nicked. But here we go. There we go. <laughs> now we're gonna try and film a little bit of Dean playing this game. Terribly, so I've never played this version. I've only ever played this on the Game Boy Advance. All right, here we go. So I'll try and get some nice footage. Okay, now the thing is with these TV screens, it tends to flicker when you film them. But you can get the overall feel. Now at the time, this Mode 7 wasn't really seen on anything else, you know, other than the Super Nintendo. Arcade machines didn't have it, but it was the first time you had something like this on the 16-bit console. Superb little game, absolutely amazing. I can't even remember how to play it. <laughs> yeah, that's a great little game. Oh, it's a, it's a very simple racing, just go from left to right. Right, so the next console we've got up here is a Sega Saturn. Um, what's the difference between this Sega Saturn, Dean? Because from what I remember, my old Sega Saturn was a black one. Yeah, this is a Japanese model. Right. Um, it was white once, but uh, it's gone very off colour. I'll tell you what though, this machine here was absolutely fantastic. It sadly didn't do as well as it should have done because of the uh, PS1, which really sort of took over the 32-bit market and really helped Sony get in there. Well, of course, the problem was that the uh, uh, PlayStation was geared towards 3D graphics, whereas this was more of a 2D powerhouse. The trouble being was that no one wanted to play 2D games, or at least that's what the publishers fall back on. Right, so this is Andy from RetroSilent.com. Now, what we're doing now is we're standing outside the uh, stand from Retro GT. You can check them out at RetroGT.com, but they've got an absolutely fantastic range of different things. So, if you follow me over here, then, Dean. As you can see down here, they've got a bunch of different Oyster wallets. You've got the ZX Spectrum one, you've got the Bubble Bubble one. And you've got loads of different variations of things there. Now you've got some veggie stairs, some cubs. But as you can see, they've really got like a wide range of retro gaming t-shirts. So why don't you come over here and look at some of my favourites, I think. Now some of the best ones here are the ones from Bubble Bubble. Absolutely amazing. And this is one that I'll probably end up definitely getting. I might buy one and give it away in a competition. We've got the ZX Spectrum one over here as well, Dean. Yep. So we're going to show that off down there. But again, all the t-shirts have been fantastically designed. And the t-shirts go for £15. You can get two for £25. So I highly recommend that you check out uh, Retro GT. Check them out. Right, guys. Take a look at these. We've got a Defender bar top machine here. Also Donkey Kong. These are in lovely condition. I would certainly like these at home. I'm not too sure how much they are. Also, let's have a look at this. I'll tell you what then Dean, now what we've got here is like a big sort of like game controller type thing there with yeah. joystick and buttons. With a but projector. With a projector screen. So Dean, why don't you show us a demonstration of how these actually go. Give a little go. Tell us what you think. Alright, so Dean is sitting down. He's giving this a little go. What game are you going to select? Burger Time. Because <laughs> that was the game that was selected. So right, game Dean's going to be playing a bit of Burger Time. So let's see how good he is. Now I tell you what, it surprisingly looks pretty good, especially in this light. And I think the graphics show up really well, actually. Well. I don't think Dean did very well, but I tell you what, it's very impressive actually seeing these old classics on the retro, um, on the big screen. And what we've got here is a Neo Geo. Now, if you point over towards here, uh, Dean, basically this was one of the machines that back in the days, in the early 90s, a lot of kids had 16-bit Sega's, 16-bit Super Nintendo's, but this was actually like having an actual arcade game in your house. Now they were really really expensive and if you look at the size of the cartridges that are there, each one of these things costs like about 
130 to about 140 pounds, so only really the rich and spoiled kids could actually have them, but I'll tell you what, they basically are an arcade machine in your own living room. Great little machines. Hi guys, this is a Commodore A600, Amiga 600. This was one very, well, this was the first model of Amiga that I bought. Um, with my very first paycheck when I started work back in 1992. The problem with this machine was it wasn't compatible with a lot of the Amiga 500 games. It was also missing a numerical keypad. So uh, it was a, a nice little machine for certain games, but it had too many uh, compatible problems with later, um, sorry, earlier releases. So it's probably one to avoid. Well guys, here's a machine that you should all recognise. It's the machine that basically changed the face of gaming as we know it today. Before this came along, of course, everything was for nerds, really. At least it was aimed at nerds. This is the system that made gaming cool. It also knocked Nintendo off the top spot after many years of being the number one console producer although Sega fans may argue with that. So, this is the first machine, the Sony mouse, don't get to see many of those. The second generation of Joypad with the dual analog controls, not the first type. But here is a machine that I never did own. It's uh, a tiny little PS1, ain't it cute? Right, so here we are again, uh, a replay or play it, I should call it. So if you can film all the way down there, Dean, here is the sort of like pools and everything that is actually showing down there. It's, it's bigger than last machines. year, isn't it? It's a lot bigger, it looks a lot more well organised. Yeah. Wow, well, look at that. We've got like another thing on the screen there. That looks like a bit of frogger action. This is the ZX81, it was the follow-up to the ZX80. Now, the first time I actually ever played one of these was when my brother actually got one. He used to have the ZX80, then he got himself the ZX81, and he got himself the 16K thing which fitted into the back. Now, impressively, running in the background is that Manic Miner that is running there. And I'll tell you what, this isn't an original game, because this one has come back out today, but it looks like a fan made the game. I don't know if you can film it, Dean, but it really is absolutely impressive for what they can achieve when you consider it's only 16K on the, Z, you know, on the ZX81. Right, guys, take a look at this. This was the so-called Spectrum Pizza, the Sam Coupe. This was the machine that was supposed to take over from where the Spectrum left off. Unfortunately, the company that produced it, Miles Gordon Technology, ran into trouble financially and the machine was very short-lived. Also, not many publishers really took advantage of the system. Here we have Manic Miner running, and as you can probably see, if I can control it here, it's a very nice version of the game. Um, it's basically a spectrum with more colour, more memory, and a better sound chip. But as I say, not many publishers were really interested because by the time it's come out, the Atari ST and Amiga had already took their foothold on the market. Right, so this is Andy again from RetroAsylum.com and what we've got here is one of my favourite consoles of all time. It's the Nintendo 64. Originally the code name was the Ultra 64 and it was a great machine. Certainly it did do as well as it should have done, but it was a great machine. And the landmark breaking game was Mario 64. It completely revolutionised 3D controlling and it really suited it down to a team. Now this is a controller down here. It's certainly odd, well, it's bizarrely odd shaped. It's got an analog in the middle, the C control buttons there, a D pad, and it's got a little button down there which was the C button. A bit awkward at first, but it's a great little control pad, and the N64 really did have some of the best games out there. Truly an amazing console, which, matter of fact, I've actually been collecting, so yeah, you can to see more videos on the N64. Right, so it's the Atari 7800. You may have seen one of our previous videos on it. Here we're playing Commando. I've never played this before. I'm not too sure if it's any good or not. I've heard it's okay. It's hard. 
Right, it's a video of Dean actually playing it. Dean, why don't you show us off the little control pad? How does that feel? Um, it's not so bad. Originally, there was a little stick on there that you could take off, uh, screw on and screw off. This button feels a bit knackered, to be honest. I'm firing and... Uh, it's not exactly doing too much. So what were the main problems in with this machine then? How come it didn't do much better than the 2600? What were the problems? Basically it was released two years too late. It was originally due in 1984, but it wasn't released until after the uh, Nintendo Entertainment System had been released in America. And the sand chip in it is the same as the Atari 78, um, 2600. So, as much as it looks okay, at least the American versions did, the sound chip on it was pretty awful. Also, the PAL version, as you can see, there's a lot of distortion in the picture, and they were all like this. So, yeah, it, it didn't do too well at all. Over here. Here's gaming classic Astro Wars by Grandstand. I had one of these when I was a kid. It was absolutely awesome. Now I can't even remember how to start the game. Here we go. You know, before the Spectrum had really taken off, this was the sort of gaming, unless you had an Atari of course, that most people uh, had to deal with. So how does it feel then, Dean, when you control it then with the buttons? Because all it has is got like a little metal stick. And we talked about this briefly on episode 24 of the Retro Asylum podcast. So it's got a start, select button, a power button, and a shoot button. I'll be totally honest with you, I'm surprised at how good this still feels. This is a good game. It still holds up. You know, it is primitive, but uh, it can still waste half hour on this over the game. Yeah, that's still good. If you like Space Invaders or uh, Galaxian, you know, you're going to get some entertainment out of this. Right, this is Andy from RetroAsylum.com. Now here we've got a, one of my favourite machines ever. It's done by Tommy. It's Caveman. Now we mentioned this on episode 24 of the podcast. Now basically all you have to do in the game is you're a little caveman, you've got to collect the eggs from the fire-breathing dinosaur or dragon, whatever you want to call it. Take it from the right of the screen to the left of the screen and that's it. But graphically, it's absolutely amazing for a game that came out in the early 80s. It's absolutely beautiful and I'm going to try and give it a little go. So, if we can film it. Right, so basically that's me. You can shoot at the dragon, shoot him on the head. You get the egg, you move to the back. And that's pretty much what you do, so grab the egg, move along, right to the back, and that's it guys, but I highly recommend that you check out this thing, absolutely amazing caveman. Right, so it's Andy from Retro Solid back again, and here we are at Play Expo, and we're heading into the arcade section here. Now this, I've got a really fun fond memory, because I grew up in the 80s, playing arcades in the early 90s, and even in the early 90s, I used to work at Sega World in the Tropidero, so I'm so used to this. So let's come over here. Space Harrier, which I think came out in 1985, and it's a great little game. You control this little guy here who flies around, and it's got like a pseudo sort of 3D before 3D actually became 3D. And it's a great game with great look and amazing music. Now it's got like this sort of like a um, flight stick that you control it with, but it's a beautiful looking machine. One of the things I want to point out, Dean, is the artwork and all the machines that used to have with that. The way it glows on the screen really drew you towards it. It's a great looking machine. Right, so we'll head over here, we've got another one over here. Come over here, we've got another one of my favourites. We've got Chase HQ, which was done by Tato. Now, unlike, say, Outrun, this added a whole new spin on the whole sort of racing genre. What made this different was, it gave you a storyline. You were a cop out to get the bad guys, and what you had to do was basically chase after the baddies and crash into them. And what I'll do, I'll film Dean Swain playing this. 
So Dean, Dean means business now. He's going to give it a go. All right, so Dean. Yeah. What's your memory of this game? Oh, Dean from Retro Asylum. From Retro Asylum. My memories of this game were superb. I played this before I ever played the uh, famous, wonderful ZX Spectrum version, and it's a great, great game. Let's give it a try. Very old. Alright, so if we look at the arcade machine, what Dean does is, it's got like the, sort of like if you're in a car, it's got the painted thing on there, it's got steering wheel, it's made out of leather, the gears, and again the beautiful artwork on the side. So what made this difference was, you had to catch a baddie within a time limit. Now the graphics have aged well, like OutRun you can change from left to right in certain places. Now, you could also use a turbo, which would actually enhance you, make you go faster. It kind of makes you feel like you're a night rider with your turbo boost. And I'm going to need to use it in a minute. Uh, like so Dean, how does it feel to be playing this game on the actual arcade as yeah. opposed to on emulation? This is great. I've probably not played this since about 1992 maybe. And uh, I feel right at home. I'm going to have to use a turbo because I'm running out of time. So basically, games like a cop, it kind of feels like your 80s TV shows, like Miami Vice sort of thing, where you've got to catch your baddies, it's all about attitude. And sadly though, the sequel wasn't quite as good, and the 8-bit conversions of the sequel weren't quite as good, but still, it had it all. It had the sound of speech, it had the um, police siren going down there. Dean's not doing too bad for time, he's got 28 seconds to go. Will he stop this baddie before the uh, game, before he runs out of time? Now, for a bit of comedy value, let's look at Dean's concentration. <laughs> There's Dean, really concentrating. Asylum.com. Very nice t-shirt by the way. Very, very nice. Lovely logo. Anyway, <laughs> as I mentioned on episode 24 of the Retro Asylum podcast, here is the Road Blasters and this is the steering wheel that I was trying to describe. Uh, very modern look at the time in 1985. So it does look like your uh, like the steering wheel for Knight Rider. It does, yes. So so what made this different this. theme compared to other races of the time then? Because it wasn't so much a racing game, it was more of a blaster. Don't get me wrong, you didn't have to steer left and right, random events, but it's more of a shooter, a bit more like Spy Hunter, but in a 3D view. Alright Dean, so why don't you show us how this game... Let's give it a try. Alright, so you've got the little accelerator down there. You've got the steering wheel at the end Here we go. Now again, Dean, tell us a little bit about how this plays and feels, you know, according to your memory and how it feels compared to playing like, emulation and on the 8-bit machines. Well, like I said on the podcast, the Spectrum version was quite good, but, um, you know, this sort of game you really do need to play on the arcade cabinet. You know, the way the uh, game controls, you can't emulate this at home with a, a normal joystick. And uh, I'm still rubbish at it. <laughs> there we go, we need these to fuel up. But yeah, what we mentioned on the podcast was Atari had a very distinctive look to their games. They all looked very different because a lot of arcade games were made in Japan or out in the East, basically. So these Western games, because Atari were an American company, they looked and had a different feel to yeah. most other machines. I think I've played this enough now on the uh, 360. What brings you back to the ZX Spectrum version? Well, basically, it's one of the all-time classics, one of the first few games I actually ever had. There's nothing quite like it, you know. It's got loads of character, loads of like interesting you know, level designs, and it's a tough game. And it's nothing quite like playing on the ZX Spectrum. And when you do die, it is your own fault, really. Like it was just then. Yeah, it's pixel tough, basically. <laughs> So Andy, are you enjoying the event today? I'm absolutely loving the event. It really takes me back to like uh, the good old days when I was younger, playing all these things. And it's just amazing seeing all these systems 
that I never got to play back in the day, and also some of the systems I used to own, like the Static Spectrum. Yeah. And this is my favourite Spectrum Emblem Plus 2, I absolutely love it. There it is guys, the grey ZX Spectrum Plus 2, Amstrad's first attempt with the Sinclair brand. Right, so basically here we are, in the middle of all the arcades, you've got uh, Sega Hang On, Star Wars Arcade, which was the follow-up which came out by Sega in the 90s. We've got Millipede, Robotron, Space Invaders, the original Star Wars is down there. One of the best games, Return of the Jedi, which was a 3D isometric type looking game. The one that started it all, well, not quite. But, well, uh, that popularized it really well, so, it. Again, it's Retro Asylum, it's Dean Swain, and these are wonderful little flyers promoting our site. So here's Dean Swain, and he's going to be playing a scroll and beat em up called Vendetta. So, why don't you tell us a little bit more about this game then, Dean? Right, this was actually a follow up to a Konami game called Crime Fighter. In Japan, this was actually called Crime Fighters 2, but for its Western release, it was called Vendetta. It's a very underrated scrolling beat em up. Um, to be honest, I prefer this to the likes of Final Fight. It's a bit more variation, uh, probably because it is a little bit closer to Double Dragon. A lot more of the backgrounds are interactive, a load more moves, and just more interesting levels. Alright, so wh why don't we look at the controls here? So it's actually um, four players. It is. Yep, and there's only two buttons. You've got punch and kick, but if you press both of them at the same time, they uh, give you a variety of different moves. You can also kick uh, players, uh, enemies, sorry, while they're on the floor. And you have also got your headbutts and knees and uh, all those horrible, nasty moves that the beat em up should feature. Here I'm playing Pac Man on the arcade. A great game. Uh, this was actually made in conjunction with a cartoon series that Pac Man featured in. And this was uh, famously converted to the ZX Spectrum and Amstrad without scrolling. It was a flip screen game on those systems. And there was a problem in that the ghosts would appear on the edge of each screen, causing the game to uh, be very difficult indeed. The best conversions you're probably looking at the Commodore 664, PC Engine, and Commodore Amiga. Which I just coincidentally, for well, for some reason, I just have it. Yeah, fresh so, off press. It's, it's not it's not to gain attention. Like look at me, you know, <laughs> I, I must be connected to retro gamer. Yeah, our latest issue is a flipper. So um, this is the main cover. This is our other cover. Interestingly, this is the cover that seems to be in all the shops I've been to. Yes, me um, too. But this is a great cover. Psygnosis. Obviously, the company's just um, been closed down by Sony. They're now known as Studio Liverpool. So we obviously wanted to do a tribute to them. Um, it's in here somewhere. Here we go. So we've managed to speak to lots of people who were involved in the company at the time. Um, and some who are still there. We've covered 28 games to cover the 28 years, and um, it turned out to be a cracking piece. We've also got this, this has been on the, um, we've been trying to get this in the mag for a while now. This is looking at life before video games took over. Um, this is a little piece to tie in with Halloween. So we've just looked at various different um, horror games from various systems ranging from Silent Hill 2 to the Mist. Uh, digital integration, I don't really like flight sims, but a lot of people do, so we got that in the mag. Uh, Wonder Boy 3, great master system game. 25 years of Final Fantasy, so we've covered every single major game. And we've got lots of key developers talking to us, so that's pretty cool. It's always good when you can get Japanese developers. Um, this is the Connex. Uh, we ran a story on this about seven years ago, before I was on the mag. This is a follow-up, and it's basically interviewing this guy who's got his hands on the only known prototype. So theoretically, Comic simulation isn't going to be far behind now. Uh, import only. Uh, this is another cool exclusive for us, making a renegade with um, the Japanese developer who is um, 
I'm going to embarrass myself now while you for, for mispronouncing his name. Joshua, he's a Kishimoto. Um, we've already spoke to him about Double Dragon. Uh, this is Renegade, part of the Kulio Jin series. Uh, we've managed to get a hold of John Carmack, John Romero and Tim Willis to talk about Doom to tie in with the new Doom 3 release. Uh, wacky way to Shigeru Naomoto. So, yeah, good issue this month. And it's available now. Oh, look, sorry, sorry, it comes with that. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes with Retro Asylum. So there you go. That's the sort of inserts that we're doing. And, um, yeah, next month, and Pilot Wings. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's a good issue. All right, thank you. Thanks very much, Darren. Right, guys, the one of the best things about coming to these sort of events is the stuff that you have on sale. Grand stand scramble, 20 quid. In pretty good nick, there's a couple of them there. All these different handheld devices, all at pretty decent prices. Some of them are boxed, which you can see. Over the back there, we've got minted games, all wrapped up, all boxed, all in good condition. Uh, guys, check this out. ZX Spectrum Plus, £90. Commodore 64 box, £75. Got Japanese Mega Drives there. Boxed Nintendo Entertainment System. That's modified, US one, £75. It's just nice to see all these games all boxed up. Um, ZX Spectrum Plus 2, £65. Super Famicom, £80. PC Engine, 55 quid. Loads of Sega Saturns. And cuddly toys for the kids or yourself, should you want one. And look, there's a Pikachu for uh, Daniel from BuzzBob. Right, what we have here, guys, is loads of Atari 2600 games. If I had it my way, I'd be putting a lot off the shelves and taking them all home. Well, okay, going price-wise, these games aren't going too bad. Some £8, £10, got loads of absolute classics there. Got Dig Dug, Yard's Revenge, and loads more, basically. We're literally spot for choice. It's really transporting us back into the olden days theme. So why don't we have a little look over here, then? What we've got over here is some of the older classics. Sorry. Loads of loose Nintendo games on both the SNES and N64. I'm sure there's a bargain you can pick up somewhere, Andy. Nintendo games, Robocop, GameCube games, there's absolutely loads. Hello, everyone, this is Andy from RetroSilent.com, and here we are again at Play Expo. And today we're going to sort of like grab someone from the event who's actually come to sort of like check it out. So, Dean, here we go. So, so, who are you and how are you finding this place? Uh, I'm uh, Leon and it's, uh, it's amazing. I've been coming for the past three years now. It's my third time I've come to this event. Yeah, and it just brings back all your childhood memories of playing computer games, arcade machines. So, what are the first few systems that you owned in? What's your generation? I, I am uh, Atari 2600. Oh, fantastic. Then on to and Spectrum's Commodore 64's. Yeah. Um, then I sort of missed out a little bit and then came back in when the PlayStation 1 first came out. Andy from RetroAsylum.com. Retro Asylum and... Swamey from Retro, Retro Asylum. Asylum. So, what, what are we doing now, guys? So basically, we're going to go around and tell everyone about RetroAsylum.com and basically find out about everyone's experience here at the show. Yeah. So let's get talking to people. Yeah. A big difference from here from last year. There's a lot more stuff on, and it's not in a smelly old hotel like from last year. <laughs> that was pretty rough. <laughs> yeah. The, anyway, well, how was your hotel? You not checked in yet. yet. You're not checked in no. yet. See, it may be the repeat of the hotel. Is it? No, 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 no. <laughs> not that place. This year we've gone five star. Five star. The limo dropped us off. And <laughs> we will check the hotel out later. Oh. Well, you better tell me about what the hotel's like. Oh, uh, we will, we will. Well, this is Andy from Retro Asylum Podcast. I'm joined by my co-host here, Dean Swain. I'm learning to bring the hood on my hand corner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hear 